Hi everyone, uh, we welcome. Uh, we're here to celebrate uh, the book by uh, one of my favorite people at Columbia, my chair of the department, Joan Cavallo. Um, so uh, I will tell you, I am Costantina Zano, I am an associate professor in the Department of Italian. Um, and I will tell you uh, the format first of the event, and then I will present our speakers and say just two lines about my impressions from the book. So um, I, after I will have introduced the panelists, I, I will give the word to Joan to introduce the book for eight minutes. Then each one of the speakers, first Anna, Barba, then Barbara, then Jumba, uh, will be talking for eight, eight minutes each. And then uh, Joan will respond uh, uh, in, within 10, 15 minutes. And then we will take the Q&A from the audience here or on Zoom. Okay, so let me introduce our speakers. First of all, the author, Joan Cavallo, is professor of Italian and current chair of the Italian department, Columbia University. She has published widely on Italian literature and culture, especially chivalric epic in, uh, in popular traditions. Her latest book, what we are presenting tonight, The Sicilian Puppet Theatre of Agrippino Manteo, was recently nominated for the Nancy Stop Publication Award and is forthcoming in Italian in 2024. She is the editor of several volumes, most recently Teaching World Epics and of the Anthem World Epic and Romance book series. Anna Lomax Wood is an anthropologist and ethnomusicologist with a PhD from Columbia University. From 1996 to 2022, she directed the Association for Cultural Equity, Alan Lomax Archive at Hunter College, New York. She is an innovator in the fields of public folklore, anthropology, and ethno ethnomusicology. She produced over 100 CDs, LPs, and box sets, several documentary films. She shared, searched for artists and their hairs, and re-established artist loyalty payments managed the digitization, restoration, and organization of the archival material and repatriation of Lomax's field documentation to over 60 local communities and regional libraries in the US and abroad. She created an open access digital catalog of Lomax's field recordings, photographs, and films, counting 25,000 items and the digital library of nearly 6,000 songs representing the world's music, a global jukebox, a, a YouTube, YouTube channel with 33 million views and 110,000 subscribers. An endangered cultures initiative to support young culture members to document their expressive traditions, educational materials, initiatives to connect the archive's primary cultural materials and research to under, uh, underserved, underserved communities, communities of origin, and ed educators, and a mentoring program. Wood's research includes Greek, Italian, and Spanish music and poetry. Uh, present impacts of historical social formations on community capacity and disaster recovery, and basic needs in under, under, underserved communities in the US. Her publications include articles published in academic and scientific journals and anthologies in the US, Italy, Greece, and China, and two books, Songs of Earth, Aesthetics and Social Codes in Music, and Hillsborough Children. Her honors include a Grammy and Grammy and Emmy nominations and the Knighthood in the Order of Merit in the Italian Republic. With Forestine Pole, she's writing a book about world movement styles and hopes to begin working on the Italian folk tales she recorded from the immigrants in the 1970s and 80s. We look forward to that, really. Jumba Lahiri, a bilingual writer and translator, is the Millicent uh, Professor of English and Director of Creative Writing at Barnard College, Columbia University. She received the Pulitzer Prize in 2000 for interpret of maladies, and is also the, the author of Namesake, An Accustomed Earth, and The Lowland. Since 2015, Lahiri has been writing fiction, essays, and poetry in Italian. In altre parole, in other words, Il vestido dei libri, The Clothing of Books, Dove mi trovo, self-translated as Whereabouts, Il guaderno di Nerina, and Racconti Romani. 
She received the National Humanities Medal from President Barack Obama in 2014, and in 2019 was named Commendatore of the Italian Republic by President Sergio Mattarella. Her most recent book in English, Translating Myself and Others, was a finalist for the Penn Award for the Art of the Essay. And finally, Barbara Faeda serves as Columbia uh, at Columbia University as the Executive Director of the Italian Academy for Advanced Studies, where she conceived the International Observatory for Cultural Heritage and as an adjunct professor in the Italian department. Her books include From Da Ponte to the Casa Italiana, A Brief History of Italian Studies at Columbia University, Elite Cultura Italiana e Statunitese fra Settecento e Novecento, and A Lost Mediterranean Culture, The Giant Statues of Sardinia's Monte Prama. Okay, um, so as I said, um, I will just share two, two, two lines about my impressions of reading this book be before giving the word to the other speakers. Um, so beyond the, its significance in literary studies, um, which is very important, but I cannot talk about that. Let me talk here as a cultural historian of the Risorgimento and the post-unification Italy and of its diasporas. And I want to stress how important this study is for our understanding of how the canon of Italianità was experienced by the masses in Italy and beyond. Uh, very few works uh, blur the line between high and low culture in this period, and most of them focus on opera and patriotic drama. Il Teatro dei Pupi, um, that is Tasso and Ariosto for the masses through a 19th century compilation, is something I have really never seen been discussed in cultural histories of the period. So I think this is really an important contribution. Um, this is also a work which adds a lot to our knowledge of Italian diasporic communities. And the newspaper passages that Joanne uh, retrieved uh, shows not only how Italian Americans were entertained, but also how the lines between Italians and locals were crossed on a regular basis. Uh, one could say that this is a family microhistory that throws light on different themes, which John actually pulls together beautifully. So congratulations. Um, now, let me give the, the word first to uh, Joanne for a short introduction of the book. So, hello, everyone. I'm very grateful for the invitation and especially for the participation of the panelists. I'm in awe of each of you. So to see all four of you at the table is, is quite incredible. Um, it's a joy to um, have students, uh, friends and colleagues, both in person and on Zoom. And it's a special treat to have three companions <laughs> behind us, thanks to the great grandson of Agrippino Manteo, Michael Manteo, and two of his friends who have transported them here. And I'm excited to be able to meet many more Manteo puppets when the Italian American Museum of New York reopens in the spring. And they'll have an exhibit and we can all go uh, visit them. Uh, but uh, for the matter at, at hand. To the right. Okay, so my book is divided into two parts. The first chapter of part one goes through three generations of Manteo family puppeteers from Agrippino's birth and early years in Sicily to his celebrated theater in New York during the 1920s and 1930s, to the efforts of his children and grandchildren from the 1950s through the 1980s. The second chapter brings to light for the first time Agrippino's extensive notebooks, uh, untangling the sets of scripts and determining the order in which they were written, discussing the relation to the source, which was Giusto Lodico's Storia dei Paladini di Francia, History of the Paladins of France. Uh, I discussed dating, the comments in the margin by Agrippino, 
and his son Mike. The core of the book are the eight uh, chapters which contain translations of eight plays by Agrippino along with uh, introductions and comparative analyses and the plays from the arrival of Angelica in Paris to the Battle of Lampedusa uh, are from the core section of Lodico Storia dei Paladini, which in turn were based on Boyardo's Orlando Inamorato and Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. The appendix has other relevant documentation, um, the list of marionettes, the publications from Agrippino's library that are still extant, the um, list of scripts in Agrippino's handwriting, uh, synopses of all extant plays in the Paladins of France cycle, um, description of the characters and the Manteo family genealogy. So what I thought to start off the discussion would be a visual excursus, uh, courtesy of photos from the Manteo family. By day, Agrippino Manteo was an electrician, a trade that he passed on to his sons. But by night, he was a puppeteer who brought the Renaissance chivalric stories to life night after night in his theater. Um, first, in Catherine Street in the Lower East Side, and then in Mulberry Street in Little Italy. And everyone in the family had a role. Um, his sons manipulated uh, from the bridge. The puppets, which you can see, were four to five feet. They could weigh 50 and even up to 100 pounds. His wife, Katerina, collected the fees. She also designed and sewed the costumes, and she spoke the female parts. Their daughter, Ida, in this photo, she's on the bottom left, also designed and sewed costumes and spoke female parts, but she also played the piano and she painted scenery. And Agrippino constructed the puppets with the help of a sculptor who uh, fashioned the heads. And during performances, he spoke the male parts and he directed the action. So considering that it said Agrippino Manteo offered puppet theater on a daily basis in New York from the early 1920s until the late 1930s, and also founded a puppet theater in Mendoza, Argentina before World War I, it's possible that he could have staged well over 6,000 plays in the course of his career. The Manteo um, Puppet Theater abruptly closed in 1939, following the illness and death of Agrippino's youngest son, Johnny. But Agrippino's love for puppet theater and bringing Shavavik stories to life was so contagious that for decades later, for decades after, his remaining children carried on the tradition. So uh, his children and their spouses, eventually their children with their children's uh, spouses. And whereas Agrippino performed for fellow Italian immigrants in a local community, his children reached diverse social and cultural groups in different performance uh, venues from Washington, D.C. to uh, upstate New York. And that uh, continued until the death of Mike Monteo in uh, 1989. But Agrippino Monteo was not only a puppeteer, he was a playwright, and therefore, I'd like to give just one example of his craft, um, which was 
adapting a 3,000 page Storia dei Paladini di Francia prose compilation into 330 uh, distinct but consecutive plays in his Paladins of France cycle. So I'm going to compare the release of Astolfo from prison in Boyardo's original, Lodico's prose, and Agrippino's script. And there you have an example of his, uh, his beautiful handwriting. So to set the stage, Astolfo had won a joust, but rather than being declared the victor, he was imprisoned by Carlo Magno because of the evil dealings of the ever infamous Gano di Maganza and his clan. And you can just tell he's evil, right? Um, and he's languishing in prison. He's forgotten for months until Gradasso of Sericana, a uh, king from uh, Southeast Asia, invades Paris, overcomes the Frankish forces, and captures Carlo Magno. So in Boyardo's original, in the Orlando Innamorato, you have the Christian population in flight. The churches were opened and the prisons. So it's, it's in the passive voice, like who opened them? We don't know. There's just a sense of chaos. And Astolfo assumed command of the kingdom because there's a power vacuum. So the first adaptation by Lodico gives us a new detail by giving agency to the people of Paris who actively seek out Astolfo. So the people of Paris, who had no longer remembered the English, oh, I have it here, <laughs> um, the Englishman's imprisonment, once they became aware of it, went to release him and each voluntarily submitted to his command, whereby Astolfo comforted those citizens, asserting that the new day would make the pagan repent of having dared so much. Then he went to comfort the empress. So in this sentence, Astolfo is no longer a self-declared authority. He is given his authority by the, by the people. And also he comforts the empress who was never mentioned in Boyardo. Agrippino elaborates the scene even beyond Lodico. In fact, he creates two scenes. In the first, he takes us to the prison and Astolfo complains about his imprisonment. And the jailer replies, I'll discuss it and we'll see how to set you free. This shows that the jailer wants to help Astolfo, but he doesn't have the means or agency to unlock the, uh, the prison. And so Astolfo remains there. How does he get freed? Here's the scene. And this is two scenes later. Galerana cries, voices of the people, that Astolfo be set free. Galerana has Astolfo released and entrusts the people to him. Astolfo goes into the square and gathers together the people in order to go into battle. He leaves. Galerana prays for victory. So whereas in the story dei Paladini, it was the people who went to release Astolfo, here the people don't have the physical means to do that. They're not only outside the structures of power, they're literally outside the stage. You don't see them appear. What you have instead is the strength of their voices. And so you have this choral moment, which is, which, um, is frequent in Sicilian puppet theater, where the repeated echo of voices gives the impression of a large group of people. So they are the catalyst, but it's Galerana now, the empress who is on center stage, who is the recipient of their plea and immediately uh, orders the release of Astolfo. Now she is the sovereign, no longer the distraught wife of Charlemagne who was crying at the opening of the scene, but the one in command who hands over the power to Astolfo. And the fact that the scene ends with her praying for victory is a foreshadowing that Astolfo will in fact save the day. And then he can go on to censor Carlo Magno for putting him in prison and, and leave. So this is just one sample. And Bill Baird in The Art of the Puppet said, all together it was a tremendous tour de force. And at the core of it were Agrippino Manteo's dramatic 
inventiveness, and irreplaceable scripts. Since the performances themselves are lost to us because they were never recorded, all we have now are those scripts. So what I basically tried to do in the book was to show the dramatic inventiveness within the scripts themselves. And I'll pause here, but I will leave you with one final image of Martiza because she wanted to greet her fellow knights. Thank you. <laughs>
These are processes common to all of the old literate civilizations in which oral tradition takes ownership of heroic figures, magical women, canonic myths, chronicles, epics, psalms, and devotions. Uniquely, Joanne's work demonstrates how that happens in the written word and how and it raises new questions. We know that the early composers of the chivalric tales drew upon the chanson de geste, for example, but these were sung and told as well as written. And we must assume that they passed into oral literature long ago, even before the Renaissance. It is believed, furthermore, that an oral uh, tradition of chivalric tales existed in southern Tuscany several centuries ago, in which plays were memorized and passed down. Was Boyardo, for example, exposed to the oral font as well? We don't know, and people don't ask this question, which I find extremely disturbing. The contribution of or orality to literature is still only faintly recognized. For example, who knows, who knows that throughout Sicily, there were once academies of poets, both schooled and unschooled, that is illiterate, semi-literate, and in universities, so-called at that time. And they were, there were also poetic gare, or tournaments, in every town. And, that, and also that working class Sicilians in New York crowded in to listen to recitations of Sicilian poetry by both folk and learned masters in the 1970s as I saw them. There is no way to surpass Joanne Cavallo's fine work, in my view, except perhaps to extend it through an analysis of the spoken rhetoric during performances, which is another project. And these are the tantalizing questions that her book has raised for me. And again, congratulations. Thank you. Um, now, Barbara, it's your turn. Thank you for inviting me. I accepted with great enthusiasm to be part of this event, first of all, to celebrate Joanne, and also because her book refers to an important period of Italian culture, not just in New York City, but also at Columbia University. Joanne writes that Agrippino Manteo moved to New York City in 1919, where he opened a pup puppet theater in 1923. Those were the years when in New York City schools, the children of immigrants used only one language, English, and were completely immersed in American culture. For Italian and Italian-American students, the only place they could speak Italian or a dialect was within the family or with neighbors. Thanks to its proximity to Harlem, Columbia included among its students many young people of the Little Italy of East Harlem. Leonard Covello was one of them. He is remembered nowadays for being an enlightened educator and a pioneer of multicultural and bilingual pedagogy. Born in Basilicata to a poor family, Leonard entered Columbia with a Pulitzer Scholarship. He concentrated uh, on French as his major, although, as he wrote, quote, my natural inclination would urge me to Italian, but these were still the days when it was fashionable to forget Italian. The first time that Covello taught an Italian language class was perhaps, as he stated, quote, the only Italian class in any public school in the country at that time. It was 1920. Later in the 20s and into the 1930s, more attention began to be paid to Italian language and culture, thanks also to Covello's efforts. But Covello was not the only child of Italian immigrants eager to study his native language and culture. An Italian club, the Circolo Italiano, was founded at Columbia College in 1911 by a dozen students of Italian descent, most of them from East Harlem. 
the Circolo often organized the theatrical performances of plays by Goldoni, Castelnuovo, or Giacosa. This club was partly responsible for the creation of Calambia's Casa Italiana, which was inaugurated in 1927 with further help from the Italian Americans and Italians. A library of thousands of volumes of Italian literature, art, and history occupied one of its floors. This is what was happening uptown. Downtown, in 1923, Agrippino opened his puppet theater. Joanne writes that Columbia students used to go downtown to watch his shows. More or less in the same time frame, Giuseppe Prezzolini, the well-known Italian intellectual, scholar and writer, was active on this campus as a visiting professor first, starting just then in 1923, and then as director of Columbia's Casa Italiana from 1930 to 1940. I can't help imagining these two Italian men, Agrippino and Prezzolini, so different from each other, although coincidentally both self-taught, working concurrently uptown and downtown in the promotion of Italian language and culture. Agrippino was moved by undeniable passion but what struck me is that he studied all his life outside of school settings, let alone academia, and did so with great care, passion and rigor. He never stopped analyzing quite extensively all the nuances of the various writings and sources, and once he possessed a deep knowledge of them, he built his own literary and cultural initiative. Some experts in this field called the puppeteers like, like Agrippino popular intellectuals because they read, studied, interpreted, reworked, and finally presented a sophisticated cultural product to their audience that, in most cases, was not educated. Same for Agrippino. Columbia students were probably the minority of his audience. Was Agrippino aware that he had set himself such a complex intellectual task? Did he understand the great gift he was offering to Italian immigrants in New York? Since traditionally one of the characteristics of the puppeteers was to make history more contemporary, I would like to ask Joanne whether Agrippino did the same with the themes of historic and literary events that he portrayed, and if his personal experiences were depicted somehow in his scripts, especially his migration to Argentina and then to New York City, and his time on battlefield in World War I. I would also like to ask Joanne, I have a lot of questions, <laughs> about the audience. Did these plays offer Italian immigrants a way to engage with a certain social discomfort? Could these plays even have been a form of protest and resistance, consciously or not, against the often discriminatory society of New York City? This book is an important contribution that goes way beyond the area of Italian studies and touches a wide range of fields. Cultural heritage is clearly one of them. Joanne opens her preface by informing the reader that the Opera dei Pupi was designated by UNESCO as an oral and intangible masterpiece in the heritage of humanity in 2001. Nonetheless, as, and this is one of Joanne's points of greatest urgency, these works run the risk of falling into oblivion. The protection of intangible cultural heritage has become an extremely pressing issue, and scholars continue developing new perspectives and strategies for the rescue and protection of traditions, customs, practices, and oral literature. Joanne's methodology is very timely, since the contemporary approach focuses more and more on building relationships with descendants facilitating engagement and co-management of archives and historical documents. Small collections and archives, such as the one studied by Joanne, tend to be overlooked, while the history of small groups and families has been shown to have great cultural significance. Joanne's book expands the frame of the picture widely, adding an invaluable chapter to the history and development of Italian culture and language in New York and the US. She has been doing heroic work with the research and dedication in this field for years. She is a real paladin. Thank you.
Thank you. If you can turn on that and jump by here. Good evening, and um, thank you so much uh, to Joan Cavallo for inviting me to be at this uh, celebration and also um, for all you did uh, during the pandemic, tail end of the pandemic, to um, welcome me to Barnard, where I, I have recently begun teaching. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful to, to all that you uh, did and said uh, to welcome me here. And um, so, this book, I had no idea what to expect when Joanne asked me to um, to talk about it. I said, well, let's let's see. And I learned so much. So first of all, I want to thank you for writing such an informative book, such an engrossing book. I mean, literally, I was sort of on the subway and I didn't want my stop to come because I really was so engrossed by the story of uh, uh, that you that you that you are recounting of, of an extraordinary man, an extraordinary moment in, in, in culture. And, and um, so I want to talk to you uh, all today sort of as um, three different sides of me. One is um, the child of immigrants. OK, I'm not Italian. My family is not Italian. My family came from India. I was raised in the United States. But I'd like to talk to you I have three points. So one is from that experience, from an analogous experience of understanding, of seeing um, what happens when people immigrate uh, to a new place and are are um, do are there's so much creativity uh, and drive behind the idea of preserving, transporting culture, and disseminating culture to another generation and sort of what happens in that, in that process. Um, because I recognized a lot of things, even though they weren't the same thing. So, so that's one thing. Um, the other uh, comment I have comes from the part of me that long ago wrote a doctoral dissertation on Renaissance literature. Um, and have, I have a few thoughts um, from that part of my life and uh, things I used to think about. Um, and, and more recently, um, and my last comments will, will sort of speak, come from my, 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 my life as a writer and a translator, mostly as the translator side. Um, so the first, uh, I'll start with the, the sort of scholarly, former scholarship I used to do. So long ago, uh, I wrote this um, dissertation uh, at Boston University on the role of the Italian palazzo in Jacobean drama, in English Jacobean drama. So what was I doing? I was looking at space, theatrical space, and particularly the role of the palazzo as this sort of paradoxical site of, um, of power and corruption and, and the choice of, um, of Jacobean dramatists to, to displace their, their work, their works, um, into an Italian space. Okay, so this is what I spent a lot of time thinking about many years ago. So when I was reading um, Joanne's book, I was immediately struck by just the, the use of space um, in these puppet shows and how the dynamic between, first of all, they're, they're being performed um, often sort of in these um, there, it's an itinerant thing, so that the space is moving, literally moving, um, and there's a rapid shifting of scenes, um, which I found really fascinating. And you say at one point that there are scenes in certain of these shows that are scenes that are taking place at opposite ends of the globe. So there's a really interesting collapsing of geography, literally geography and space. Um, and I was so struck in the um, the 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 script of the madness of uh, Orlando of um, just how many alternating scenes there were and they're sort of wavering between a castle and um, and and outdoors and there's language of, of imprisonment and there, at, one, at one point Anselmo says orders the prisoner be sent to death um, and there's also this language of, of treachery and betrayal um, in act three Orlando says that treacherous woman betrayed me. 
So I was really interested in how these settings were functioning in, um, in these puppet shows. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the second observation I have, and this comes more from my own, as I said, analogous experience of being the child of immigrants is literally the, the, the displacement of Sicily in New York, sort of how that is, how that plays out by means of these, these performances. Um, and, and the, the creation of, if you will, a sort of errant uh, Sicily. I, and I think so much of the experience of, of, of being an immigrant or the child of immigrants is the, the ongoing tension between rootedness and the, the desire for contact with one's roots or one's origins and the inevitable moving forward and the errant energy that, that, that is taking over um, and, and, and changing things because a new generation is born. And as you point out, the language, therefore the, 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 the ability to maintain the language, to understand these shows, um, the scripts, the language, which is already, you know, um, all um, uh, changing from the original text to the script to what is being performed. And then I imagine through the generation, sort of the audience of the 40s versus the 60s to um, into the 80s. Um, because even, even, even then, even English is changing. So of course the Italian is also changing and one's absorption of Italian as the generations are, are moving forward is, is changing and I imagine diminishing. Um, I was struck that the, the shows moved at, um, in their, um, uh, in it, one of their destinations was the University of Rhode Island in the 1970s, because that's where I was raised. And so who knows? Then I was thinking, maybe I saw one of these shows. I mean, it's so it's entirely possible that I saw one of these as a child, but though I don't have a memory of it. Um, my, my only real experience with seeing puppet shows, interestingly, is um, it does come from India, where there is a tradition of puppetry that comes from Rajasthan. And there, too, it's an itinerant, it's 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 often a you know sort of a nomadic or quasi nomadic um, population that that puts on these shows and moves from place to place. Um, so this idea of sort of a moving Sicily, uh, I found very um, very moving, and I found that the the sort of how you note the mix of languages that comes into the the scripts um, uh, to to acknowledge the sort of change in the public um, and what would be their their ability to engage with the text with the tradition right with the with the renaissance works then transformed and sort of the so the question is what happens when a tradition is uprooted and 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 reinvented and turned into a you know a clearly hybrid cultural project uh, product for a clearly hybrid um, audience member who is partially Italian, but partially American. Um, and, I, and I feel like, I mean, looking at these puppets, another thing that comes to mind vis-a-vis -vis immigration is just the idea of how one literally has to be remade um, as an immigrant. And I think these puppets are very metaphorically um, evocative in the sense that they are they are so life-sized and life-like. And I feel that they represent in some sense um, the remaking um, of the self that, that takes place when, when one, one is errant, right? Um, and, and so this word errancy is, has a lot of currency in, in, in your book and in, in your, um, you know, your own errant study because the book sort of moves from the history to analysis of these notebooks, which was utterly fascinating to the to the to the scripts and the translation themselves. So this leads me to my final uh, observation, and that is, of course, the question of translation and the and the and the work, the the in, incredibly imaginative work. You call it interlacing of Agrippino as he's navigating from poem to script. And so this is an interesting, the question of, of genre that you, that you mentioned. Um, 
so interesting that he mixes poetry with prose, that there's octava rima in addition to prose passages. Um, and I think you show something that um, I, as a translator, am always trying to um, communicate, which is that straying, straying from the original uh, makes something, in fact, more original, can make something more original. So, you know, this, this errancy that's connected to the nature of displacement and loss um, can, as we know, be an enorm enormous gain and, and, a, and a new beginning. Um, but at the same time, I think for a scholar, um, and I imagine if I were still sort of a, the Renaissance scholar I thought I was once going to be, I would be, you know, sort of pouring over the different texts and thinking about questions of authenticity and the nature of the text and what is happening as it's as it's shifting as it's as it's uh, you know as it's as it's um, undergoing metamorphosis. I would say. Um, so, is the goal to give given that the goal of translation is always to connect to the audience you know so what what has to be done um so i felt like your book showed sort of the life cycle of um living the need for living translation and how how crucial it is um the act of translation to to reach a reader or in this case a, a public right um and it brought to mind a question. I'm always sort of thinking about different metaphors to understand what it means to translate, what it means to recreate, uh, rework a text from one language to another. And I feel that you've, you've, you have, you have given me another way of thinking about what a translator, who a translator is and, and, and what she does. Because in some sense, one can think of translation as a form of puppetry. And I mean that in that one feels connected somehow to this by strings to that original text, but one is moving freely and it's an interesting sensation right to translate a text and you don't feel completely free, but you are replicating right um, replicating a literary text or a text um, so this question of autonomy the autonomy of the translator, as opposed to the to the strings that um inevitably must be cut in the in the case of a translator at one point um not so much in the in the case of the puppet because the puppet would collapse um and my one question uh and here i will end is um i was curious about the figure of pinocchio and carlo collodi who is born a, a few years before agrippino um and I just was wondering if you know if he, you know, what his engagement with that text was, with with the, the significance of that text. Um, and I also was curious about the Disney version of that story in 1940, which I saw as a child. I actually read the the a version of Pinocchio before I saw the movie, which terrified me, of course, um, because. Pinocchio is the errant boy, you know, who gets punished for his errancy. And there's so much um, sort of the morale, the, the moral is stay home, stay with, stay home with your father, don't go wandering around. Um, but in some sense, everything you describe, everything we're talking about tonight is the beautiful result of, you know, what happens um, when people leave home and try to take, bring some, some of, of, of what is home into a new place and to recreate that. So, thank you. John, uh, thank you all. John, I I'm afraid you only have 10 minutes to respond. And feel free to, to stop me if I, if I, because I'm not looking at the, the clock. Uh, well, I want to thank you for those the gracious uh remarks and thoughtful and thought provoking and um i'll try to i took a couple of notes to answer some of the um points that were raised but the first thing i want to say was your um final question Jumpa, about pinocchio because 
I have not found any connections between the Paladins of France cycle and Pinocchio, but there happens to be a former student, Salvatore Taibi, who uh, is getting a PhD at Rutgers with a dissertation on Pinocchio. So I'm kind of shifting that question and leaving it in the air uh, to see if in the future there kind of might be some kind of uh, connection, connection brewing, but I'm not gonna tackle that myself. Um, I think there's a myth and a reality. The myth is if you've seen Godfather 2 and there's that mafioso walking through little Italy and he stops and sees the puppet performance, those are the Monteo puppets in, in, by the way, in the film. But his comment is, oh, it's too violent for me. And he walks off. And so it's ironic because he's a, he's a mafioso boss and he's about to be assassinated. And there is the, the puppets, how could they be violent? But even the, despite that irony, I think that's an impression I would have had because if you go to Sicily and you see a performance for tourists today, you don't get the, the dialogue, you don't get the cycle, you get the sword play, you get the body sliced in half and piled up on stage. So that's what you think it is. But traditional Sicilian puppet theater, the reality behind that was really grounded in literature. It was grounded in the masterpieces of the Renaissance through the prose of, of Giusto Lodico. And it was, it, I mean, the chivalric soap opera. It was night after night and there was drama and suspense about what would happen. There was a lot of community uh, discussion when I started, thanks to Paolo Tartamella, who's also in the audience and brought me uh, puppets in the 19, like the late 19, uh, 90s, and I went to Sicily to see what was going on, where they were telling stories that were the same as the stories that I loved and that I was teaching at Columbia. I would sometimes talk with former audience members, and they would knew they knew the stories by heart. And I would ask them, "Okay, tell me about Marfisa or about Angelica." And maybe naively, I'd want them to have an interpretive discussion about what they really felt about these characters. But instead, they would just start from birth, all of the vicissitudes to death. Like they knew everything uh, by, by heart. And they kept that story um, throughout their lives. Whereas going into a puppet um, play in Palermo for an audience of tourists, even though the tourists, some of them were Italian, afterwards going backstage, uh, and it, an Italian woman said to the puppeteer, okay, but just tell me, does Angelica marry Rinaldo or Orlando? <laughs> and so there, there's a complete disconnect with the audience of today with respect to the audience of many um, decades ago. But the, unfortunately, there was no one going around and interviewing the audiences in the 1920s and 1930s in New York, the way that Alan Lomax was going through Italy in the 1950s or also through the US, through Spain, uh, documenting the popular culture. Um, we just, we have newspaper articles where reporters interview family members and they write down the few details that they get, lots of contradictory um, details uh, so that we don't even get to reconstruct for, for certain the, the family history no less the kind of hearts and minds of the public. So we can project ourselves, we can imagine what they felt through the text. And I would say that, and I think in response to Tavardo's question about the um, kind of what the audience uh, expected and, and felt, there's lots of episodes about justice and about injustice. And the most treacherous character, not only in Agrippino Manteo's uh, puppet theater, but in Sicilian puppet theater um, in, throughout its, its history, is that Gano di Maganza. And Gano is the second in command after Charlemagne. He's Charlemagne's right hand man. So, on the one hand, he deflects some of the anger towards power. On the other hand, he always brings us back there because Charlemagne is very often in cahoots with Gano and in sometimes tries to. Um, not only banished, but also had uh, his paladins executed. So I think there's a lot of underlying anger and um, 
sense of uh, protest, but also at the same time, a yearning for, for justice and beyond the political aspect, just living in life. Am I going over 10 minutes? Okay, so I'll, finish, I'll finish with this. Just, it's not only, there's three times of violence. One is the group violence, the external forces, the Spanish Saracens versus the Christian Franks, or um, the Asians who come to um, invade France or the North Africans who, who invade. So that's one kind of violence. Another kind of violence is Say the rebels um, who protest injustices coming from the um, political uh, rulers. And the third kind of violence is just individuals who have uh, diverse, well, who have the same desires for objects or uh, women and they fight each other. So brothers, cousins, friends who then become enemies. And that's something that everyone dealing with in real life could find on the puppet theater stage. Thank you. That was quicker than... <laughs> so you still have two minutes if you want. But, <laughs> okay. So I think uh, we have five minutes to take some questions. So I, so I actually wanted to ask a question about the performance language. So. You know, the scripts were written in Italian, but most likely the working class people who watched the performances were not speaking in Italian, probably Sicilian. So did you get a sense of like what the performance language was? Um, John, may I, I just gather one or two questions together, perhaps, and then you can answer all, any other question? Uh, yes, Nelson. As you were talking um, and seeing these puppets, I was thinking of Paisa, obviously, uh, 1946, and the famous puppet scene. I was just wondering, is that relevant? In, I mean, it's it's a different. Are those Sicilian puppets in Naples? Because it's it's set in Naples. Well, everybody says Sicilian puppet theater, but more correctly, it would be Southern Italian and Sicilian puppet theater. I mean, it's just shorter to say, yeah. Opa de Siciliana. And also because today in Sicily, it's still thriving, but there was puppet theater uh, throughout Italy. There was more hand puppet theater in the North, also based on Giusto Lodico, uh, Piedmont, Lombardy, mm. uh, Rome, Modena, Naples for sure, a huge mm -hmm. uh, culture and the, the, the scene that you're talking about, I originally thought, and I also read somewhere that uh, mm -hmm. the soldier goes because he feels the solidarity with the Saracens who are attacked. Yes, yes. But since he attacks those on the right side of the stage, that's where the Saracens are. He attacked as a Christian. So he attacked as part of the, the paladins of the Christian army. Oh. So I, I have to go back to that, but I think that there would be an interpret. The more you know about Sicilian puppet theater, the the better you can yeah. interpret that particular scene. Sure. Um, the question about performance la language, thanks to a couple minutes of archival footage in Tony De Nonno's uh, knock, it's a one family knock on wood. There is a scene from Agrippino Manteo's um, performance where you can hear him speak in Italian. And the uh, dialect or the, the popular language would have been reserved for the farcical characters who commented or who spoke in between scenes. But the knights spoke in uh, beautiful Italian. So maybe the random literary person who went to a puppet theater um, performance would say, oh, well, if they made a mistake here and there and would think that it was not proper Italian. But really, the puppeteer was an educator. The puppeteer was bringing standard Italian taken from Justo Lodico's really meticulous um, prose compilation and bringing that on a nightly basis to everyone um, from the, say, the popular audiences who would, who would listen to it. And if I have another <laughs> minute, what makes, I think, Agrippino special in addition to his 
personality, his creativity, was that in Sicily, his mentor was Giuseppe Crini, who was the son of the foremost, the, the founder and foremost practitioner of puppet theater in Catania, in Eastern Sicily, but who also brought to stage Greek and Italian classics with live actors. So the formation that Agrippino Manteo had was one of which was the avant-garde of, of Catanese culture, and that did not distinguish between some, this high culture of Italian and Greek classics and low culture of puppet theater. It was all the same culture, sometimes with human actors and sometimes with wooden puppets. Amazing. Thank you so much. Congratulations again. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening.